I'm a marketer, and I tell stories for a living. Today, I also have a story to tell, and it's about the big data and its impact to our economy. When we see big data, people normally will tend to have two impressions. A is a new concept just emerging in recent years. And B is more about the technology, not the economy at all. But the fact is, this concept has been around over a century. And since its very first breath, it's all about economy, not the technology at all. So today I'm going to combine my personal story and with these two domains of knowledge, economics, and technologies, and take you back in time to show you how big data played an important role in our economy even before the buzzword big data exists. To prove my point, I'm also going to carry out a small experiment right here on the stage to show you why we can't, not, why we can't afford to not pay attention to this uh, new signal to the future economy. So first thing first, what's about my story? I was born and raised in China during Cold War. In my childhood, a very unique part of my life is to uh, wait in a line with my grandmother outside of so-called rationing shops and to buy groceries for the whole family. Like this photo. Not just groceries, back in that time, you could not buy anything just with your money. You also need to pay with the so-called ration coupons at the same time. Let me give you some example. If you want candies, you need to get your money and the candy coupons. If you want a new bike, you need to get your money and the industrial coupons. If you want a new shirt, you need to get your money and the textile coupons, so on and so forth. This weird ration system started from 1950s and eventually ended in 1993. So for people who live outside of China, you probably have two questions right now in your, in your mind. One, why didn't people just go directly uh, to the merchants or even manufacturers and buy from them? And B, probably the bigger question is, why we have this rationing system even when we didn't have a uh, long, period, uh, long period lasting uh, of natural disasters? And uh, the most important is, how my story relates to the topic on my talk today. The answer to the first question is very easy because there was no private shop, no private merchants back that time. The state owned farmland, the state owned factory, the state owned even the distribution network. So there was no option at all. The second question is a little bit complicated. So please allow me to borrow a page from the economic books to explain to you. No matter which school of economics you subscribe to, we can all agree in an ideal economy, the market always tries to balance the supply and the demand at a point called the equilibrium point, and the price at the point in economies we consider as a fair price. So it, it works very similar to a English auction, the, the most common type of auction you see that uh, uh, the bid got higher and higher every time. So before an English auction, both buyers and the sellers gave their information to a neutral third party, the auction house. So for buyers, you know what you are buying. And for the sellers, you know how many people out there are interested. And during the auction, buyers can also say how much price the other buyers are willing to pay. So as a result, the final bid or the price to sell the deal is always paid on or very close to the fair price that we just discovered earlier. But in real life, most of situations are not like auction. We don't have an auction house for everything. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm the tailor in the town. You don't know how many hours needed for me to tailor this jacket. You also don't know what's the price the other buyers are willing to pay for this very same jacket. So for you, the consumer, you don't have the access to this information. But for me, the seller, this information withholding gave me a little bit of power to allow me sell you at a higher price 
than the fair price. So in economics, this considered as inefficiency because resources is uh, allocated inefficiently. So the economists start to think, okay, if the economy is not running efficiently, and the problem is because lack of information, let's create a nationwide neutral third party. Enter big data 1.0. Gauss plan or Soviet Union state planning comedy was created nearly a century ago. It also had a Chinese counterpart. They were the very first big data firm sponsored by their own countries. And you basically can tell what their job just from their names. Their job, simply put, is to collect all the data. The data of how many products you can produce and how many other products you will, you will need, you will use. And they crunch all the data for the whole nation, try to match the supply and demand and come up a, a to-do list for each of you for next year and the year after. But apparently, they both failed their jobs. Gauss plan dissolved in 1991 as a result of the economy collapse, and uh, its Chinese version also renamed and restructured later. Ironically, what happened exactly after all that is now famous to the world. The China's economic growth miracle. This miracle not only make China, makes China the second largest economy in the world, but also created the largest middle class population on this planet. So here's a million dollar question right, right here. Same people, same conditions. Why the miracle didn't happen in the first place when you even had the help from state-sponsored big data firm? The person who answered this question won the 1974 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, Friedrich Hayek. Hayek pointed out two major flaws of any central, uh, centralized data-driven economies. First one, any centralized data economy, data-driven economy is incompetent to crunch all the data. They don't have the capability and also they don't have the responsibility and the reliability when there is any calculation errors. So that's from the macro level. From a micro level, this centralized supply and demand manipulation also kills innovations. Let's circle back to the tailor's example. Let's say if I'm the tailor in the town and I'm selling a little bit higher price than the fair price, so there's a little bit profit for me. And another person, another young man in the town may think, okay, tailoring uh, jacket seems like a profitable business. So I also want to get in this business and open my shop. Maybe I can provide a better service or provide more options. But what if, according to big data, you can only sell your jacket at the fair price. So for this young man, why should he shoulder the extra risk and become an entrepreneur? That's exactly why all the planning economy countries suffer stagnation of technology and the innovations. So I just present you the past and explain it in a from the economic side. But where's the future, where's the technology? I believe most of the audience today here are very familiar with online shopping and have experience of that. I have an Amazon Echo right here with me. So let's say if there's any difference when we buy from the same shop, but through different means. Alexa, bad batteries. The top search result for batteries is Amazon Basics AAA Performance Alkaline Batteries, 36 count. It's $12.65 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. I also found Amazon Basics AA Performance Alkaline Batteries, 48 count. It's $19.54 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. 
That's all I can find for batteries right now. Check your Alexa app for more options. Alexa, do you have any other brand, any other batteries from other brands? Sorry, I don't know that. So here you have it. And what we also have here is the result when you're shopping from your laptop. So if I was a marketer working for Duracell batteries, I will be very worried by now because according to Alexa, your product doesn't even exist. So same shop, same database, but different results. I'm not the only person who noted this phenomenon. Professor Scott Galloway from New York University is the first person I know who discovered this. Like most people, I too enjoy the convenience and efficiency of the technology. For example, getting my online orders in just one or two days, or even quicker if you live in a big city. But everything comes with a price. The more you use, the more data it collects, and the more dominant it becomes. Just last year, Amazon accounted for 44% of e-commerce sales in the United States. Across the, the Pacific Ocean, situation is the same. Alibaba last year, also last year, Alibaba generated over 17 billion US, US dollars in just 24 hours. I know. It's a shocking number, but the most interesting part is not just about this high number. The most interesting part is Alibaba is already starting to use their data to direct the R&D and even manufacturing of some famous home appliance brands. So basically, that means they know you will like it even before you see the actual products. So here's my the main takeaway of my talk. You can only predict with the data you have. And the new data only comes from innovation and the competitions. We, the Chinese people, used to have a dominant super data to process all the information, make prediction, and match the supply and the demand. And at the very beginning, it worked until it killed all the innovation and the competition and the energy for the future economies. And we, the people, pay the price for this dominance. I believe the worth of any technology breakthrough is not only measured by its achievements, but uh, also how those achievements last and how they are remembered. Today, I'm standing here, share the lesson we learned four decades ago. 40 years down the future, who will tell the story of today's big data? Will it be another lesson learned, or will it be elixir? Thank you for your time.